Okay, welcome to the Metropolitan again. I tried this last week and it didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. The camera just wasn't holding steady. So I'm taking a little bit more time to do this this time and we're going to be less ambitious. And uh, we're heading up to the European uh, art section, which was just recently reinstalled. There's a ton of um, paintings up there, more than I could possibly fit in this video. In theory, they've rearranged them. But my experience in the rearrangement from looking at them twice now is that I can't tell of any improvement that they've made uh, with the rearrangements. But it is nice to see the uh, masterpieces uh, back in place, although there's a lot of European art there that uh, I don't particularly find um, uh, special, uh, especially from the uh, 1700s and the 1800s, uh, England, Spain, the 1300s and so on and so forth. Um, the Metropolitan doesn't really succeed uh, or excel in those areas, but it does excel with the Dutch masters and um, several other uh, important uh, European sections. So uh, I'm going to just try to focus in a little bit better this time, but we will walk up the staircase. This is the grand staircase. I am going to walk up the staircase so that you can get the feeling of what it's like to come to the Met and make this trip. And then after we get done with the staircase, I'm going to go directly to the um, to the Rembrandts, which is where I left off last time, but I'm just going to go straight to them this time. The last videos just were too shaky to handle. Hopefully this anti-shake is on and this whole thing will work out this time. And we'll get a quality. Quality video. Canon is much better at this, but um, I'm doing it this way anyway because this camera has much bigger videos. So I'm hoping it'll work this time. Um, in theory, they've changed this from doing it by each country to doing it by time, and I started last time in that direction. And uh, I don't know how they do it by time. These are early pieces, obviously, with um, a lot of tree sips and so on. I'll just give you a taste of this. The Netherlandish painter, 5th century mystery of the Virgin from 1500. I don't waste too much time with this though. <coughs> if you really want to see these or this kind of paintings, you really got to go to London where they have this. Kind of portraiture. Okay, so we want to go to. I'm going to walk over here. And over Christian archaeography, we're going to walk past this. I was waiting. Although this painting's a little bit interesting. We'll get a shot of this one. This is, um, you know, before they really mastered perspective, they had some of these early um, architectural works, which almost got the perspectives perfect, not quite. They were working on it. And this is Tempera, uh, Giovanni. This painting probably should get more attention than it does, but whatever. 
In any event, let's continue. Of course, I made a wrong turn here. But I'll get to where I want to go anyway. We're Nothing like a few nudes to, to make the day. This is Titian's workshop. If you want to see a lot of Titian's, the place to go is the Prada, for whatever it's worth. But um, in Spain and in Madrid, it's worth the trip, by the way, just to see that museum. But this is his workshop, even. It's not really, I don't think, pure titian. You know, this one, you see, you feel like every museum you go to, you find this painting. So uh, Titian seemed to like this painting because he did it over and over and over and over and over and over again at various sizes. This one's smallish. This is the Macy's Gallery. I don't know. The Macy's would approve of this gallery, but whatever. Just doing a quick look around here. Not what we're looking for. I'm looking for 616. So we're going to start. This one's interesting. This is an early work. Uh, Originio, Girl with Cherries. Okay, now this is from Italy. And I don't, this can't be, I don't think this is oil, this is probably fresco. But um, this is oil and wood. All right, if they say so. What's interesting here is uh, to you know, it's post Leonardo, and you can see his influence with the smoking, the smoke effect on the um, on the uh, you know eyes and the highlight and the, the shading. What I find interesting here is the cherries. You, you see the attempt here to get the hands right, which they, which is a hard thing. You know, hard hands that make them feel natural, hair that it looks right. You know, they tried. Um, he's a moderate artist, so to speak. You know, he's wouldn't wouldn't you wouldn't put him up there with Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Got this nude over here. Let's see if we can get this one. This is a. The, yeah. The problem with this one, there is no problem with it, it's fine. But I'm comparing it to my experience with the uh, Crow and Noah Museum where they have life size paintings of this ilk um, from the 1520s or so, um, maybe earlier even. Anyway, this is also Giovanni. Uh, not what we're looking for, but we're getting there. Okay, this is closer. This is Jockey. 
and um, just want to get one look at this. It is kind of cool that you have to, you know, no TV, no movies or anything like this. They used these as devotionals and they really believed that they had magic powers. So the painters had magic powers of sorts. This, uh, when you open this up like this, it almost does feel like you're opening up a window into a world that, that background that he did uh, is an early example of decent landscape, very decent landscape. This is one of the better pieces of work actually in the museum, in this section of the museum. Um, perspective is interesting because it's uh, each one has their own perspective as if this is open, supposed to be open like such as it is, not flat but like three quarters and uh, it's, uh, it's a lovely work in and of itself. You can see um, changing influences at this point. I'm just going to move on. Now, this is The Harvesters by Brogel. This is very significant work. Um, Brogel was world famous, him and his son, even by this time, and he did work with Rubens. Um, they, uh, he, he took the time out to do uh, everyday people, peasants, and so on, and um, not just uh, aristocracy. And look at that wonderful landscape into the background, where you can see the entire waterfront with ships coming in. Um, the tree is typical of Brogel, it's not perfect but it's artistic in its own right. And of course, you see um, personality in uh, most, of the, uh, most of the peasants. Color is terrific. This is worth seeing in person, this piece. Okay, and let's just move on into the Rembrandt room. Okay, so here's the main Rembrandt room, 616. And I'll take some stills from here also. Um, they haven't had all their Rembrandts out until now. Um, their most famous Rembrandt is uh, that one over there, which is uh, supposed to be um, Aristotle or Socrates, I forget. Aristotle, that's what it is actually. Um, they have a, a very famous collection of Rembrandts and overall the quality of them is uh, very high um, although you can probably find better examples of specific Rembrandts in various places the London Museum the art galleries have a tremendous collection of Rembrandts some of the most fantastic ones actually uh, of course the Rijksmuseum has uh, you know, the Night Watch among also um, the Jewish Bride, so that's probably the cream of the crop. But the, but the Met has got really a, a wonderful collection. But of them all, I like this one the best. And it's, it's a pleasure to see this. Um, now, there's a little bit of a story behind this. This uh, is supposed to be Aphrodite, and the um, shield has uh, Medusa on it. And uh, there was a bit of a friendly competition, or maybe not so friendly, between Rubens and uh, Rembrandt. And Ru Rubens did a fantastic uh, uh, Medusa. And what happened was Rembrandt decided that he could do it better. But instead of doing it in full color, he just did it as a silver ornamentation on this shield, um, which looks just fabulous. The illusion is, the illusion on this shield is not like anything I've ever seen anywhere else in any other piece of work of art. Um, the jewels are just, um, when you come up close to them, are um, abstract. It, you know, you don't, you, you know, you don't see all of the light, or all, there's no attempt here to, to paint every line here, and to leave the illusion to the eye. 
And uh, the Dutch were really masters at this. They had really started to, to figure out about the effects of human optics and, uh, and light. But the, uh, the uh, Medusa in silver is just fabulous. The white highlights are perfect. I mean, they really are perfect. This jumps out at you in huge three dimensions, even though it's two dimensional, obviously. Uh, it's a flat painting. There's no, uh, you know, lifting of the paint here like you might see on other works. Um, and uh, the effect is just stunning. It makes Disney eat its heart out. Right? And then you have this, the metal of her brothel, or her whatever you want to call that, the, not brothel, but uh, her shirt, whatever you want to call that. And then that's obviously copper highlights up there on that top. I just love this painting. I really do. The background, like most Rembrandts, is somewhat faded because of the varnishing that's been done over decades, over, over centuries at this point. You wonder, you know, we're lucky to have Rembrandts because the varnish just keeps getting darker and darker. Eventually, something usually has to be done about it. And I'm going to show you another example where the painting has been largely destroyed by the darkening of the varnish. But um, we are living in a time and place where we still have access to, uh, to them. Yeah. Now, moving along, this is uh, got a sister painting over at the Rijks Museum. It says, "Portrait of a young woman with a fan." I find it hard to believe they really don't know who this is because um, I, seem to, I think I recognize this woman from other Rembrandt paintings, but maybe it's just I've been here so many times that I see it here. But. Um, He uses, he's done similar works to this in other, in other museums that you'll see. Uh, the, the Tripper uh, portrait at the Rijksmuseum is probably uh, the most famous of them. Uh, her eyes in that painting are just fabulous. And the eyes in this painting, maybe not so much, but what you, what you should take really notice here is, and what makes Rembrandt excel even at this stage of his life, this painting was Let's see, 1633, so it's relatively early in his career, in the middle of his, of his early part of his career, I'd say. And um, the hands are always delightful. Both Franz Hals and Rembrandt do amazing work with the hands. They just are so natural and expressive. And the lace. Um, and you'll see different kinds of uh, um, techniques used to do lace. When you stand back, the lace looks, um, you know, very realistic. Uh, but as you get closer to it, it gets a little bit uh, more um, uh, abstract in the painting. Try to figure, like, if you're standing about this close to the painting trying to paint this and how difficult it is, try to figure out what the painting is going to look like when you stand back seven feet from it. It's, it's, that is part of the brilliance of the talent. These laces are brilliant, of course, because it's Rembrandt, uh, but they're not quite like what you'll see um, in, in the abstraction of them uh, in the later works that he did with this lace. And there's the pearls. Let me just get a look at her face. I'm not tall enough. It's the expression in the face that also just sets him apart. You can see that the two different eyes usually are going in different directions because we don't have perfect symmetry. And so he doesn't attempt to do this perfect symmetry. In fact, that's, uh, you can usually tell real Rembrandt when the eyes are a little goofy, actually. But um, he, he does them just so that they're off enough to give a real sense of reality to the, uh, to the, to the painting.
Okay. Go to the, once again, to step back. All right, moving along here. This is one of my favorites. This is, by Rembrandt standards, this is a huge painting. I have to step back to this. Um, he, this fellow is in several Rembrandt paintings. He's got, he's with this one in the, in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles with the guy with the feather, you know, which is a fabulous feather. Um, I don't know who the model is exactly. I'm sure they've researched this. Um, these costumes that he wears uh, came out of Rembrandt's arsenal in his house. He had, um, he put himself basically in hock uh, and destroyed his finances by buying tons of uh, artistic things that he could use in paintings and so on and so forth from various centuries and so on and so forth. He was a huge collector and he just put himself right into uh, poverty, you know, until he lost his house and everything. Um, but this is uh, an example with the turban and the uh, just beautiful, bellowing, luscious coat. I'm not sure exactly, you know, my impression is it's, it's, it was some type of wool. Um, and again, with the hand, just a very, very, very nice hand. And, th and this fellow has marvelous eyes. And again, you can see one eye is a little bit lower than the one on the on our right or his left, and the other one is higher up. Asymmetrical eyes, which give this an extraordinary feel to the uh, to the uh, emotionality of the painting, where you catch a moment of this guy's uh, uh, of his of his thinking process. And it really breathes life into him. And this is what Rembrandt did that, that was better than anybody else's capability of doing it was just to bring these uh, two dimensional paintings to life um, and catching the moment of intellectual thought on the face of the, of the uh, character. It was more important for him probably to get the emotional status or state that he wanted of the character than even getting, you know, a pictorial perfection of it. Um, and so, this becomes uh, more important as we go along. All right, let's continue on over here. This is one of my favorites, but unfortunately, this is the painting I was referring to before that has had been basically washed out by the varnish over time. Um, it was very likely that the woman that's in the background, this is supposed to be a bit Sheva, and somewhere in the upper right hand, or in the upper left hand corner, there's supposed to be uh, King David looking down on her while she's bathing, a very famous story that uh, Rembrandt liked to do from the Bible, the um, mother of Solomon. Um, the uh, skin tone is, 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 is so different. It was funny that the Italian painters said Rembrandt is the, is, is the man who, drew, who paints the ugly women in the north. That's how they looked at him. Um, I they obviously didn't seem to understand. Um, and to the modern eye, maybe also they don't understand, but you have to look, uh, when you get used to looking at it um, and familiar with the, uh, with, uh, with Dutch painting in general, and these in specific, you start to begin to understand um, just uh, how nice these are. Uh, you know, these women have their own beauty in their, in their, in their person and the way they handle their entire body. Um, it's, it's really quite interesting. But you completely lost to the varnish aging, the background of David up there. He's supposed to be up there somewhere, I don't see it. Even my camera can't adjust for this. My, uh, my still camera automatically sometimes fixes the darkness. Okay. Getting back to this painting. Um, <clears throat> the varnish on this uh, painting has uh, damaged it, unfortunately. And there have been attempts to clean it, which also damaged it. 
But particularly what's interesting, um, historically speaking, is uh, the woman in the background who's taking care of her hair. It's been hypothesized, I don't know, and you can actually see this perhaps, that uh, she may have been originally uh, an African uh, woman. Uh, Rembrandt has painted them previously. And then it's like somebody Europeanized her, her look at some point, and um, the quality of the painting of that uh, portraiture in the background is just not uh, what uh, would be up to Rembrandt. So this, this painting has been tampered with because, one of the reasons is because the varnish had gotten so dark on it. And in order to try to salvage it, uh, there have been a number of attempts to try to clean it. Um, it's still an amazing work of art in its own right. Um, and the varnish problem becomes even a bigger problem. I'm going to let the tourist take a thousand pictures of this painting, so we'll go on to this one instead. Um, here is um, uh, Hendrik Stoffels, which is one of his um, housekeepers that he fell in love with after his wife died. And uh, this is a portrait that she did. Um, I don't remember if she had children with the, he had children with this woman. He, there was another uh, uh, servant. She may have been the one that got him in trouble because uh, she, she sued him for uh, for power money, so to speak. And the church didn't look very favorably on that. Um, and they uh, punished her and punished him. Uh, he was harder to punish because he was. Um, you know, he was Rembrandt, but still, they punched them both. Now we'll get to this one. Now here is supposed to be the grand masterpiece of this museum, which is the uh, Rembrandt um, Aristotle. Um, this is not my favorite Rembrandt here, but the museum likes it. And when um, the uh, Dutch had uh, made an agreement with, uh, with the Rijks Museum, tried to make an agreement with the Met in order to transfer some paintings back and forth for exhibits, um, one of the ones they wanted in return was this painting, and the Met refused to let it go because they said it was too uh, brittle to, uh, to, to move. Um, of course, they moved it off the off the ceiling, off this wall, because they just redid these entire section here. Um, but uh, they refused to let it go. And you could see there is, da I don't know if it's damage, it's, it was just the varnish from the top of this. It's, it's hard. The entire background is basically lost to uh, the varnish. This is not the way they were intended by Rembrandt to look. They were supposed to be brighter and lighter. Um, but the, the varnish just got darker and darker. You know, with the night watch, uh, it was a daytime scene that they turned into a nighttime scene, which then they cleaned, and now it's back to being a daytime scene. And this is not much different, but I don't think they can clean this because they think it's too delicate, and they're probably right. Of course, that always reminds me of Girl of the Pearl Earring. Have you ever seen what that painting looks like before it was uh, redone by the Martin House? Uh, you see, like, almost a third of the painting is uh, cracked paint and gone. The rest of it, what you're looking at, is actually the genius of their curers, or their, you know, or their modern painters who are trying to fix it. So I don't know. I'm not an expert with regard to that. Um, but the main thing that uh, is about, that makes this painting famous is the expression on his uh, face, which is supposed to be deep contemplative thought and um, a three quarter uh, portraiture that you see, and of course the hands are, um, you know, expressive and an integral part of the expression of this painting. Um, the cloth also is, uh, you know, he's just great with the cloth. I mean, there's nothing that Rembrandt couldn't paint. Um, it's just not my favorite. My favorite is, is the one with the you know, the Aphrodite with the silver shield, but, um, 
It gets a lot of attention, this painting. Aristotle would have bust a Homer. All right, now we'll move on. We just did this one. So now we're gonna move on to this, this portrait here. Um, I've never seen, I don't remember seeing this fellow painted in any other painting. So this may have been a, a portrait that was, that was perhaps, you know, paid for by the sitter, as opposed to some of the ones that aren't. Um, it's a standard bearer, Flores, Flores Stoop, 1654. So this is relatively late in Rembrandt's career. And you can see here, um, a mixture of his later techniques of, 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 of thick line work with more thin line work. Well, I think it's interesting here, for whatever it is, you see the, his ability to do the jewels and the sash over and over and over again. And here you have the eyes, mixed eyes, and the feather. And a key component to these paintings is their um, condition. Um, these ones at the Met are, suffer, I think, more problems than the ones that you might see overseas in, in, at the Rijks Museum. But look at this wood. This wood looks so real, this staff, um, which is some type of flag behind it. You know, it's what's supposed to be a steady bearer, right? That's what he is. Um, this might be somebody from the Night Watch uh, painting. I don't know. You know, but look at the wood. The wood looks so real. And when you get close to it, you wonder how did he do that wood that makes it look so real? And you can see it break down and get more um, abstract as you get really close to it. So if you're painting this again, you know, six to eight inches from the from the from the from the painting, trying to paint it, you have to be brilliant enough to be able to understand what the painting is going to look like when you stand back and uh, in detail. And uh, Rembrandt made no mistakes uh, with this stuff. And I'm going to show you a little bit later on the other side of this gallery. There is a Rembrandt uh, knockoff. That is simply not Rembrandt. And you know, if you look at enough Rembrandt, that it's not Rembrandt because there's errors in it. Geometric errors, there's something just not right about the portraiture. Uh, it's not perfect. Here, you have two asymmetrical eyes, again, but they're right. They're, you know, you recognize that as biologically right. I mean, there's nothing here that's it's wrong. I mean, um, and the nose is perfect. So, um, and that's true about every one of his uh, faces. They are uh, asymmetrical, but, uh, but perfect. Um, there's not a stroke, it feels like, in any Rembrandt painting that you look at where there's a, a stray brush stroke, you know, without reason for being. Um, every stroke is, is right. And when you look closely at this wood, that's an example of it. When you look close, you know, you can see that not every detail of this wood is painted, or that, or that glove for that matter, right? But when you step back, it looks like a real piece of wood. And that's, that's, that's part of the, the miracle of Rembrandt. Let's continue on now. And this one, Woman in Pink. Um, let me just uh, take a quick look at what he wrote here. Her forehead crisscrosses with jewels in the center of this portrait displays pink or carnation, a symbol of love and marriage, etc. You can read this for yourself. This is actually a Benjamin Altman uh, painting, which is fascinating, actually. And you can see the, um, the carnation there. And again, you know, this painting suffers from being darkened by the, uh, by the varnish over aging, over the aging process. I'm sure that that carnation must have been outstanding. <coughs> the bright red. I've seen other Rembrandts and uh, dull colors are not really what he does. You know, that is suffering from age. 
Um, the hands look like uh, some work was done, perhaps with that. You can see uh, there's light. Now remember that there's no electrical light, so everything is natural light. So when Rembrandt draws a spotlight effect, and it's completely from his imagination, on the rose, um, or on the carnation, sorry, not a rose. Yeah. And then there's the portraiture, and again, asymmetrical eyes, but not perfectly symmetrical eyes, um, and the nose, and the mouth, and it's all quite perfect. There's this red, this rouge color, and there's a lot more uh, broad line stroke here than there is uh, art, which makes me think that this is probably an older, one of his later works. Um, I don't see an age, I don't see a date on this. It says early 1660s, okay, I'll buy that. That makes sense to me. Because by the late 1660s, he was doing very, very rough work, and it was, and you get a good example of that over at the Frick. You're not in Frick as the Met. All right, moving along. This portrait. Man sitting with glass. Well, this is glass, so you can't see it anymore. This portrait most likely predicts auctioneer Peter Haragov, who once handled sales of his famous portraits. Okay, so this is one of the older portraits, or I'm sorry, later portraits that he did. This is supposed to be a um, portraiture of one of the art dealers in Amsterdam. And um, this guy was famous for handling Rubens uh, paintings. At least that's what it says on the little write-up over here. Um, another portraiture that we find, of course, what else did, you know, Rembrandt didn't do just portraiture as you would think so from looking here. He did do some landscapes for whatever it's worth. But, um, and the mill. Here you can see uh, he's really using much more of the thick, um, there's two aspects to this painting that you'll start to see here. One is that he's using much more, probably because this is a friend of his and somebody who was an art critic, he can get away with it. But one of you see that he used the th more of the thick line um, brushstroke uh, techniques with this painting than you see with other ones. Um, you certainly see that in the hand over here. Um, the other thing that you see is that it's almost got an unfinished feel to some of it around as you move away from the center of your eye towards the outside of the painting. It, um, you know, he just um, decided uh, he didn't have to do so much work down there. And I don't know if that's the right way to put it. He has let, I mean, there were some paintings that he finished where they were simply, you know, uh, background images and so on were left virtually in the raw. Uh, that is, the way they painted these is that there was a grot, which is a, uh, like a beige background on the canvas that they put in there. And then they painted over that to lighten it up with, uh, with layers of white or, or leave it dark with layers of dark. One of the things about the uh, Aristotle painting that's kind of unusual is that you see that he painted black. Usually they leave the black in the background um, with darker colors in the background. They paint the white colors in. But um, here you could see um, that he just more or less like that hand is looks like it's 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 barely painted because that's the background color up to the to the grot. Um, and he did this more and more as he continued on in some paintings, but not this one particularly. But you can see a transition that's involved with this uh, work. And like I said, he probably got away with this because this is uh, was a friend of his who was a huge art dealer, Peter, whatever. You can see it for yourself over there. Now, moving on to this, his self-portraits. Rembrandt's self-portraits are the most amazing pieces of art of everything he does, except for maybe the Night Watch, because he knows his own face so well, so he's able to paint the expression so greatly. The one that's in the, um, and you see, he did self-portraits from the time he was 20 years old all the way to his death, so you see 
his entire life basically uh, you know painted which is an amazing thing in itself and maybe unique in the art world um, this is a later work obviously because he's an older man here um, and the other painting that's similar to this is the one that, that's even more fabulous is the one that's in the Frick collection one day we'll get down there and take a look at that again but this is still just an outstanding picture and what makes this self-portrait is so amazing is the facial expressions which in this especially in this case um, it's uh, fabulous I mean uh, you can see him formulating a response to something that you said and formulating uh, an answer I mean this is the Western man's mind which made Western civilization rather unique or definitely unique, especially at this time in the 1600s, especially in Holland, um, and uh, presented in paint. You won't find this in any other civilization, and nobody does this as well as Rembrandt, and his portraits are the best at this. Um, all right, now we can move on to um, some of these other ones. Now we're going to move into some areas that are not Rembrandt, but this is Rembrandt. This looks like an earlier Rembrandt, actually. Um, 1640, yeah. And you can tell that it's smoother and more finished. Very much like you might expect to see in, um, in, um, in when he was at the height of his uh, financial prowess trying to do portraits of everybody. All right, and here you can see the uh, lace is uh, relatively unabstract, right? I mean, he, he looks like he's trying to do it, you know, as it actually appears. Even when you get close to this, it doesn't really break down its abstraction, as you would see in the other painting over there, the, the woman's uh, place. Uh, we'll see more in the Franz Haus paintings when we look at the Franz Haus paintings. So. Uh, and um, you know it's pretty typical of his of his, of his uh, 1640 work. I don't know if his wife was still alive at this time or not, but it is what it is. Okay, I'm gonna let this go for a moment. Okay, so as we come down here, we're gonna be looking at uh, they consider these rivals to Rembrandt. Um, I don't know the rivals. I guess they were in his time. I mean, there was a competitive marketplace for art. Um, this particular work is by Govich Flink. Now, Govich Flink has an interesting history with Rembrandt. He was one of Rembrandt's pupils. Um, and um, he's an, as you can see, he's a wonderful artist who, in his own right. Uh, that beard is uh, outstanding. Um, on par with Rembrandt? Not, no. Uh, but exceptionally good artist. Um, and what's interesting about uh, Flink is, is that when the Dutch got done or got ready to build late in Rembrandt's lifetime the, uh, the, um, the Amsterdam uh, town hall down there damn square, you can go see it today, uh, Rembrandt was supposed to uh, paint a series of paintings for it including, uh, you know, Clasis and the Barbarians, which is a mythology from the Roman period of Dutch, myth you know, Dutch or Dutch mythology, so to speak. And uh, they didn't like his work. Uh, on, and so they made him rip it down and they uh, uh, hired Flink to replace it. Um, I was in that location a couple of times. I don't remember if Flink's work is still up there either, to be honest with you. Um, the, his, but Rembrandt's probably his last masterpiece wound up in Sweden. He cut it down, which is really a pity, uh, and then took the cut-up piece and sold it off and it wound up somehow in Sweden. Um, one day I'm with my son and I'm telling him this story that I just told you on this film, or on this video, and uh, as I'm talking to my son, we're looking at the Night Watch, and he goes, Abba, is that the, uh, 
Is that the one you're talking about right over there? And I looked over my shoulder and there it was. So it wasn't in Sweden, it was at the Rijksmuseum for a period of time. I was astonished. So uh, I did get a chance to see it and it's great. I have great uh, pictures of it. But uh, in any event, Flint was basically, you know, caused Rembrandt's paintings to get taken down over his fire instead of Rembrandt's paintings there. Um, now we're going to look over here at some Nicholas May's works. This is an interesting piece for another reason, I'll tell you in a second, but the Mace has some wonderful stuff at the Wallace Collection in London, um, which is a museum that you really should go see. Uh, if you ever get to London, go see the Wallace Collection. Uh, it's got a huge number of, of Dutch masterpieces painted uh, all over the place, including quite a number of Jean Steins. Um, what I find what's interesting, Nicholas Mace is good. I mean, Tobrogan's good, Mace is good. I mean, these people were all great. They just weren't Rembrandt. I mean, it's what you can tell, what you're going to say, or they weren't Vermeer, right? But what's interesting about this that I find interesting in this painting is this uh, red uh, hat, which I've only seen in one other location. Not that that's my ignorance, probably, as much as anything else. And this red hat um, reminds me, or looks to me, like the red hat that Vermeer paints in his painting that's in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the red hat, the girl with the red hat. And this is the only other one I've seen. Now you can see also what's interesting is that they were bright enough to, uh, or advanced enough to cause the, to understand that the red would reflect down into her face and makes a red complexion along her forehead and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, uh, you can't take anything away from Nicholas Macy. He did some wonderful works with uh, household women uh, sewing and so on and so forth. He's, he's an outstanding artist, one of my favorite Dutch artists. Um, here is, he did some great domestic scenes, actually. And here is, in fact, he, he did some fabulous domestic scenes. Here's another one that's one of his domestic scenes. Uh, this is a baby or a toddler. And the, this is the Dutch work, the first time that you see these toddlers or these children done like children. Um, I mean, babies are hard to paint, uh, historically. They don't sit still, so there's that problem. There's no photography, remember, so it's very difficult to, to get it right. But the Dutch mastered this, and uh, this is, looks like a, a real toddler. So, and this was a breakthrough with them. Here, you could see the layers of uh, the green the lovely green that comes through that window and the light through the window, um, very similar to the Vermeer style. Um, he, he was, I don't know if Mace was in, was in, he was in Amsterdam or if he was in, um, uh, in Delft. He was probably in Amsterdam, you know. Um, but, but you see this, the way this light is laid out is, uh, is uh, commonly done like this. Um, in many of these paintings in this window. Um, just look at the detail of that table, just to take a look also. That little still life within a painting, a painting within a painting, right? Is, is that that's still life. Now, I'm closer to this painting. In the Rijksmuseum, they wouldn't have any problem with me. At the Met, I'm surprised I'm not being yelled at yet. They will yell at me if I keep this up. All right. <clears throat> So there's, just to get that closer again, of that picture of the, okay, let's, let's take a look with the other camera. This is the Canon imaging. It doesn't take this nice of a picture, or it's large of a picture, but it does stay steady. So there's that. There's also, Now this is a Rembrandt, as opposed to the ones that we were just looking at. And you can see the perfection is there. There are no stray uh, paint marks here. Every, every line is perfect. The face is perfectly um, aligned correctly. Um, and the forehead is well done. And this is an early Rembrandt because you can tell because it's smooth. You know, 1632. So at 1632, Rembrandt had this level uh, perfection already. So there's that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now moving along here. This is Franz Hals. <laughs> um, it's a great Franz Hals, actually. Nothing to dislike about this painting. Um, the technique with Hals is different. Uh, he is earlier on much more abstract in his painting. Um, you go that black color that you see all over this painting also. Um, look at these hands. Hals has just wonderful hands. And when you get close, they are uh, abstracted. As you can see, a little bit too close. I'm going to eventually get yelled at here. And you can see the lace of these friends Hollis is abstracted. Yeah. And the glove is abstracted. Have you ever seen John Styx's uh, portraiture by Rembrandt? That's somewhere. Um, but even for Hals, the what you see here with the um, the lace is uh, it's not as abstract as it is in some of his other paintings, his later paintings. So when was this done? This was done, let's see, in 1643. Of course, that's, that is the Franz Hals pose, you know, whatever it's worth. Now this painting, I'm hoping the sound's working here. This painting is interesting. This is behind glass. I don't notice if the other ones are behind glass. Uh, this is behind glass. But this is one of the most unusual, it's flora, it's supposed to be flora, but it's supposed to be, I believe, that I've read that this might be a post-mortem of his wife after she died. And what makes this different than every other Rembrandt you see is uh, it's completely in profile. And she is, uh, her, her look at her face is a bit stiff. Um, about 1650. You can see him using much more of uh, the board stroke technique in the in the billowing um, uh, clothing. And then you know the uh, rich green brown tones. You know, the glass makes it so hard. The rich green brown tones that you might see in the background to give this painting depth. It's a fabulous painting and it's just different than you know, really most of the other Rembrandts. Okay, now at this point, we're done with this gallery and we're going to move on to my other two favorite uh, sections, both of them from Dutch. One is going to be the um, the landscape section, and the other one is the Vermeers. Okay, we'll be back. Okay, this room is one of my favorites. Um, although they did just like I said, rehang everything. But what's cool, I like the landscapes. I love the Dutch landscapes. The Dutch virtually invented landscapes. They were they were landscapes done in the backgrounds of other paintings, and we saw that. In the 15th century, on the, on the altarpiece that we saw, you know. But the landscape being its own uh, protagonist to the painting, as I heard somebody else put it, is something that the Dutch very much um, created, where the people are meaningless to a large degree. I mean, not in this particular case, because this is some John the Baptist, whatever. I don't know. I don't care about Christian iconography. Uh, they're, they're using this as an example for it, I don't know. The real, we'll move on over here and we'll start really seeing the landscapes. Okay, this one is uh, Art Bandenier from 1650s. And um, this is Swanish painting, I mean, 
just so you can see um, its genuine size. Um, and it's got, is that a moon in the, in the background, looks like? And the fire in the house, it's nice. And then you the trees. What you don't get a feeling for here is a sense of wind. You get atmosphere, you have a feeling of atmosphere, but not wind. In fact, there's so little wind that that fire on the right, that campfire that's on the right, the wind, that, that, that they're just going straight up. Um, so there's no wind to speak of in here. Um, here's a, another one, it's almost modernistic. Looks like this is something kind of picked up at uh, King's Plaza, you know, by some artist. But, uh, you know, there was no uh, paint in a can back then. Everything that they did, all the paint that they did, they had to create by hand. And you can see this in the background of the sun, which was something that they were working on uh, at that point. Although it's kind of interesting because you see the uh, echoes of the Vandekamp, uh, maybe? With the uh, ice. And the uh, art of the people on the ice, so it's that frozen, frozen uh, kind of what it is. It's not a cow. Um, a lake of some kind? Okay. And then we can move on to uh, Salman van Rashtal. Now there's two Rashtals, Jacob van Rashtal and Salman. Salman is considered the lesser of the two. They're both awesome. You know, so I feel bad even saying that. And every time I hear somebody else say that, I kind of cringe. Um, you can see here that uh, they squash the landscape down and build the uh, sky here, as opposed to here. Here, there's much more sky. And here, it's almost all sky. You know, and they might have had an artist just do the, like the background sky, and then they would paint the. Uh, you know, the, the uh, landscape in there. And, and again, this is everybody on the ice. And this painting is Salman van Rushdal, and it says in the eight, early 1650s. Now, you gotta remember that they literally hung these paintings in, in bars to sell on the market, <laughs> which would be somebody drinking a pint of beer. <laughs> so um, these landscapes were popular for that reason. And um, and you could, and who they're pitching these to makes a difference on on um, on on the the feel of the painting and what the painting is trying to extrapolate for. These were paintings were painted to, to sell, as opposed to Rembrandt's, where he had the, the you know the painting was largely sold before it was painted. It was painted for a patron, perhaps. I don't know if that might be a bar itself. I don't know if that flag means that there's a bar. You can see the, the flag there. All right, but Salman Rushdale is quite good. And this was unique. I mean, the Dutch were doing this and nobody else. But the real great ones are over here. Um, This is Peter Molen. He's he. I always remember him because he did that uh, small painting with the all the children in it and the family. But um, actually, that's not him. I take it back. Um, this is a sand dune, which is a little bit like the uh, sand dunes that are where the Crow Moor is in Amsterdam. If you've been there, um, that national park is a bunch of sand dunes. Uh, there. Um, these landscapes, even though you see them here, uh, painted as such, they were not, um, they were not, um, these landscapes were not um, real very often. They were compartmentalized, they different put together from different sketches that they may have done. They went out, did a sketch of something, did another sketch of something, did another sketch of something, put it all together into a painting later on. So they're very, they're, they're, they are hallucinogenic, you know, like uh, 
real components put into a put into a uh, fake uh, paint, into a faint into a fake painting altogether. So sort of like Solomon Dolly, maybe or Salvador Dolly, without the without the craziness. Um, they tried to make it look real, but it wasn't uh, real. Even Zamir's picture itself was real. So now this gets to now to my favorite painting in the museum. Um, which is, maybe that's not fair to say, there's other paintings also. But this is Habimer, who is the master of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of landscape. They say that uh, Jacob Rochdale was the real master. I disagree, Habimer was better. And I'll, I'll explain to you exactly why with this, uh, with this painting. This painting is a very good job of explaining why Habimer was better than Rochdale in many, many, many regards. Uh, um, there's um, every time I see a Habimer, I stop. One of the things about Habimer, first of all, that is right is his trees. He does magnificent trees. It is not easy to uh, do all those little leaves and somehow turn that into a realistic looking tree. And whenever I come here and I take these pictures, I always try to get close to the, uh, to the structure of the trees so you can see the painting itself. Right. Now the other thing about Rochdale's or about the uh, Abima is his perspectives are marvelous. Uh, he has very deep perspective. Um, Rochdale sometimes has it too, but uh, he, he's not as good as Habima with it. But the, the thing that's most amazing to me about Habima, as opposed to all the other landscape artists, is that the picture is a composite whole in that you can feel the wind as it breezes through the rustles through the leaves, so to speak, that it all is correct. As if you're catching a moment in time um, and you don't find one tree with leaves leaning one direction and another tree with leaves moving in another direction. It's always, always correct. And um, in this one, it, it's rather still. There's not much wind in this one at all. But if you look at other habimas, it becomes more apparent even than this. Um, there is just a slight breeze in this painting this way, you know, um, very slight. And you can see it in the grass here. And in the way these small bushes are bent, flowing towards the, uh, towards the right. And then up here, and then up on the top of the, top of the tree, it's a little bit different, which is the way it often is with the atmosphere. The higher you up go, the winds will be slightly different. And then there is the magic of the house inside the uh, woodwinds over here. The Habima is just the best. Look at that silver blood over there. You see that that's one species of tree here that's within the other species of tree back here. I mean, he was just marvelous with the flora, just incredible. And uh, here you have yet another species of tree, probably an oak of some kind. And then back here, I'm not sure what that is. I want to say a willow, but I'm probably wrong about that. But it's, it's, it's probably another species back there. Um, and it's great in the road and the dog. Of course, you can get really close into this. Let me see it. And within the con, with just within that, which is maybe like a six by three of the of of the picture, which in total is probably about two and a half feet by three feet or something like that, you have a um, nice, lovely picture uh, that would have stood by itself as a masterpiece, right? But that's not it. That's not the whole picture. That's just a little bit of it. And that's the whole thing. And the perspective is wonderful. I can't even figure out how the perspective is. You know, because if you look into this house, it looks like the perspective of this house is correct. And there's definitely perspective that way. And then you have this little snippet of landscape back there. With yet, is it that there's three perspectives possibly going on here? Wonderful perspective. Okay. 
Then you have Jacob. Now this is Jacob Rush dial. Um, and I'm not going to say anything. You know, this is Rush dial. I mean, Rush dial is a masterpiece. I think. I think that I was at the Franz Hals Museum and there was a wonderful rush, a couple of rush dolls there that were just fabulous. They were really nice. One of them was, I'm not sure if he did the one with the straw boat, but rush doll was, was considered the best landscape painter by most experts, of which I am not. But, um, and uh, this is a deep perspective also, um, similar to Habima's deep perspective. And you can see, unlike the woodlands, this is sort of like farmland. And the wonderful trees. But his trees, these are not Habima trees. I mean, they're great. But, and the sky dominates here. It says here, 27 views of fields by Rushdell survived today. This is, this, in this celebrated example, the artist uses the building blocks of land, sky, and sea to create an imposing vision of cultivated nature. On the road before us is a man traveling with the packs as approaches a child, and, and the cumulus crowds dominate the sky, add their own element to the drama. A glimpse of boats at sea on the far left knits this consensually Dutch landscape into the wider world. They see boats on the left? Yes, they do. Okay. I did not notice that. I've seen this painting a dozen times. I didn't notice that. This is a celebrated one. I don't know what to tell you. Habima is better. Habima, Rochdale. Habima, Rochdale. Habima. Rushdale. Habima actually gave up painting at some point. And then you have the famous Dutch cows. I'm not going to get too much into these. But this is Albert Kuyp. And Albert Kuyp is a fantastic painter. He did some wonderful uh, paintings for, uh, you know, uh, ocean paintings, sea paintings, boats, and so on. Uh, and he also did some uh, still lives. So he seemed, Kuyp was an all around. Uh, you know, fabulous artist who did almost every junior in Dutch painting, and he's got a uh, market named after him in Amsterdam, so there's that. And here's the cows. You see this, and you know, you, they were familiar with the cows, and they knew their cows. I've seen cows come up in Svat, Israel, off the mountainside, and I'll tell you something, I don't get near them. They're big. And they got pointy things on top of their heads. But, um, the Dutch were uh, very proud of their cows. And, and Albert Kuyp, um patriotically um, uh, presented the fat of the Dutch land. And then you come over here, and there's another cup. And what's interesting about this one, I find, is that I would not look at this and say, ah, this is Albert Kuyp, because it doesn't look like an Albert Kuyp to me. It almost looks like you know, like a work from, like a British work from the, from, a, you know, from the, from the 1700s rather than the 1600s. Um, it was around 16, around 1650. I don't know. The thing is, this was done, I think, you know, to get these portraitures done correctly. Um, maybe it hang in the family garden. Not the best work by Krupp. I mean, that horse back there, I've seen Krupp do better than that. These horses are magnificent in the front, but they feel like they're almost overly painted. And then you have 
Fran's post. Now, what's interesting about Fran's post is that what makes this different is that uh, these were uh, overseas in uh, Brazil or South America. Fran's post wasn't the greatest artist, but he was, he was the greatest artist in, in the New World <laughs> at this very early time, 1650. I mean, New York was you know, not even 10 years old uh, as, as an independent city at this point. So, um, or town. Um, people were hungry, though, to see what it was like in the New World. And you have um, these, you know, Native Americans with their arrows and their bread and their, their baskets. You would never know that there was any animosity between the Dutch and their, and their holders at this time. Just, um, you can hold this so you can read this for a second. All right, here's a Simon Bilger from Rotterdam, 1640. This is all sky. We take this for granted now because you see this so commonly now, but uh, at the time, this wasn't so common. Um, you can see this hanging in a barn, somebody buying it. Well, according to this, what uh, they like about him is that he had a restricted uh, tonality to the color of the, which is specific to the ocean. Now, I can understand that, and now that I'm looking at it, I understand what they're talking about here, because uh, when you have, when you're on the ocean, the, uh, you almost get a, a, you know, the sky and the water can sometimes almost disappear on the you know, as a horizon, because the, the, the water sprays atmosphere into the air and illuminates the color that you see at the same time. And that is what he paints with a very constricted coloration here. Um, how to draw, how to paint water, that's a really good question. Here you can see how we did it here on the bottom corner, up that corner. Uh, my favorite uh, person who painted waters in the Habim is waterfalls that he often has uh, that's not here, that's in the Reichs Museum where you see the waterfalls. There's also other ones in other locations because uh, he did that uh, he did that often. Um, this is uh, Van Goya. Now this is uh, one of the um, this is all sky, right? And it's totally flattened the, uh, the landscape here. This is a smallish painting by the way. Uh, see my see my hand to the painting, I'm not going to go about six inches from the painting there. And you could see here, almost like a bird's eye view uh, of things. I mean, maybe you could see something like this from a, from a steeple, maybe not. Um, but they tried to imagine what it was like to see things as you would see them from an airplane. And it's interesting what they did uh, with this, you know, to get these these over, over, over the top sort of images. One of the reasons why the sky is down, I think, is because they want to give you this idea that you're high up looking down on this, uh, like you're even looking down on that um, windmill over there, giving you a broad vision of the, uh, of the skyline. And, uh, the Jean Van Goyen is, 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 a, is a Dutch master. That's fairly well known. I always thought that it's interesting to think that uh, when it comes to the, uh, he's from Harlem supposedly, well this is from Harlem. Yeah. 
what I thought that it's always interesting to know is that, uh, you know, these unfamous run-of-the-mill Dutch masters of the 1650s and 60s were greater than, <laughs> would have been great masters of their own right if it wasn't for the fact that, uh, you know, there was Rembrandt Howells painting with them. Um, if they were in Spain, they would be considered, they would be drowned, you know, they would be considered, you know, unparalleled. But they weren't in Spain or France, they were in Holland, they were with dozens of other of these fellows around. All right, so on that is that. Now, this brings me to uh, the next section I wanted to see, and this is going to be the end of this uh, visit today. And this is the Vermeer Room. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, ba -dum. Everybody just got to stop here and stare because Vermeers do that to you. They make you stop and stare. Um, actually, it's not just Vermeer here. Let's look at what we got. I have here uh, Matsu. Matsu is a great artist. I love Matsu, actually. What I like about Matsu is his characters, his painting technique is great, but, you know, but he's not Rembrandt, but he's great at showing Dutch life as it as it lives, you know. He was really very. I loved his work. There's always. He's not quite John Stein. You don't see a bunch of humor in his stuff. It's more authentic than John Stein. You know, John Stein is trying to be. You know, trying to do sitcoms. Um, but Matsu does tender pictures of children and their um, their mothers or children that are sick. In this case, you have. This woman who's got all the representations in, of being uh, lovesick. You know, she's got this little heating element underneath her dress, and uh, which means that she's hot. Take that for what it's worth. And then she's sending this letter off to this manservant who's going to deliver this letter for her. Meanwhile, there is, uh, you know, music playing, um, and uh, they call this a musical party, right? Um, this is this is a love letter, and then they have Matsu here um, with this uh, with this uh, painting of a map in the background, also. Yeah, this is not just about music. I mean, when you see that type of iconography, that has very it could mean many things, but it, when it's in painting, it almost always means that there's some type of um, you know, uh, she's got one coin here. Peter Van Hulk, the straw. And you, in the background over there, he you know, pulls in all the details. Here you got the cityscape in the background, a church, and a little bit of a pond, or whatever. Through this window, you see this, you see the town and the city. Here you see the family that's sitting here, the faithful dog. And then there's the negotiation, whatever this negotiation is that's happening between um, this woman and this man. Technique, he's a master. He's no doubt he's a master. Is he Rembrandt? No. Is he Vermeer? No. But his art uh, and his perspective and his eye m makes, him, makes him a master. I mean, it, uh, you know, it, 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 very few people could even tackle, would even tackle the subject matter this well as he did. Um, and perspective is fabulous, by the way, right? Look at the top. Let me move from there. Right? All natural light, no artificial light. It's just a form of realism. It says, in the yard of a country inn, a fashionable, tired man and his hostess appear to be disputing his bill. In this background, other guests continue their revelry while the man delivers, while a man delivers sheets of wheat, and a woman and child look on. You just have to love the way that this is just this breaks through to the modern world where they paint. Um, 
you know, things based on their everyday life. I mean, they have meanings and symbolism that they try to bring through, but at the end of the day, they will paint their everyday life. And these things would hang in bars, and they would try to sell them. And that's one of the reasons why they like that. Now we get on to the Vermeers. There are, on this Vermeer here, there is um, many, many, many uh, writings, books. I mean, it's true about every Vermeer. Um, they, they took this apart with x-ray, and you could see that there is a man that used to be standing in, in this doorway, and he's gone. Vermeer made changes as he went along. And um, this is uh, an early Vermeer, I believe. Um, you have um, almost a Manet feel to the uh, to this carpet that's up on the uh, up on the table here, scratched up. Then you have this almost Cezanne like um, uh, you know uh, st a still life that's in here. And then there's the way the light shines on her head which uh, captures you in a moment. And then the, the map, the background. And here is another painting which has been identified uh, somewhere, I forget where it's going, but that's Cupid. And that painting is known, so they know about this painting. And he just included a painting in a painting. For me, it was very famous for doing that with very decent detail especially his favorite map, which you seem to put in all over the yeah. But she seems to have had, she's supposed to be a servant, you would know that if you were Dutch in the 16th century. And she looks like she's had a rough night. And she's trying to contemplate uh, you know, her morning. Um, here, it says, a misbehavior of an unsupervised maid servant was a common subject of the 17th century Dutch. Nestor did a very famous painting of his, of, of a woman who, or of a maid servant who was supposed to be a little chatterbox listening to everything going on in the house. Anyway, yet in this depiction of a young maid dozing next to a glass of wine, Vermeer transfigured an ordinary scene into an investiture of light color and texture that supersedes any moralizing lessons. The top glass on the left crumpled table, carpets, and recently part of visitor. So let's look at that. See, now, you know, look at that. There's, there's the glass that they're talking about. And this is how we, you know, you're looking at centuries go by and how the paint just doesn't, uh, the, the varnish darkens and so on and so forth. There is the uh, glass that they're talking about right there, which I didn't even see until they mentioned it. And I looked at this painting a few hundred times, probably. As far as I could tell, there was no glass on this painting, which is why you could see this so well. Now, I have to admit that the guards are being very nice to me here because they're letting me get very close to these paintings and talk, I guess, I've been around this museum enough where maybe they recognize me, but uh, I don't want to push my luck, so to speak, with it. But there's no glass on here. There was a time you'd be able to see all these paintings without glass, and they looked better. Um, the glass flattens everything. Here is a, one where you, there, it's behind the glass. This is also a mirror. Here is one of his early works that used steel, and here you see the classic Vermeer uh, lighting of the wall uh, that you see with the milkmaid and various other paintings that he does. Um, and um, I don't know if they, they, pro they must have sent this to the Rijksmuseum, probably. I mean, they had 27 of the 33 paintings in the world the mirrors at the Rex Museum, so there was only about six of them at the instant. I don't, I'd imagine that, that they sent. Um, here she's playing the guitar. 
the, but the magic of this painting, and you start to really see it, is Vermeer's ability to catch, you know, life as it exists between the ticks of a, between the ticks of a second hand, so to speak. Um, she's in movement here. She's she's not s stiff, which is part of his magic. I mean, he really is able to get these. I mean, Rembrandt is most famous for this, but he's able to, to make them, even though you got them in a flash. Remember, there's no photography at this time. So this concept of you get a splack of a second, a moment in time, the twirl and the twist in the, in the milk, in the milkmaid, and so on and so forth. He gets that, he, he, he tries to get this idea of a flashing moment in time where the, the characters are in motion. As in, in this case, you can see her, she's tuning her, her lute or oboe, whatever they call that instrument um, there. And it's unfortunate this is behind glass because you really lose the detail. See my, you can see my face in the, uh, in the color of this uh, background here. Now, this always reminds me when, I, when I'm taking pictures like this, the, the times I'm in the Rijksmuseum and I had my full-blown macro lens up on my Canon and I was about an inch and a half from the milkmaid before it was had glass on it. And I'm thinking to myself on a cold winter day or in January in, in, in Amsterdam, and I stepped back and I stepped back and I hit somebody. And uh, sure enough, it was the security guard. It was a woman's security guard, it was about six foot tall. And she goes, I didn't mind you getting close to the camera, but would you do me a favor and please take your backpack off your shoulder because when you turn around, you're likely to hit the, hit the painting. <laughs> And then she spent the rest of the day with me, you know, going through the rest of the museum with me. Um, but I got really close to the picture there. I, mean, I was thinking, my God, I'm like a half inch from, billion, from a billion dollar painting. But anyway, um, this is behind glass. You know, the maniacs have been going around, paint, you know, putting spray paint on, and, and cans of soup on paintings. And they've left really no choice but to put the stuff behind glass, which is really kind of bad. Instead of doing like this, I wish they would just box it behind glass. It would make it, I think, easier to see. Um, moving on, we'll let these people see this one. See, the thing about the Vermeer room is it's always hard. There's tourists here, so always. Well, I picked a uh, quiet, uh, quiet day uh, with uh, snow outside, so I was hoping that I would you know, have maximum amount of time to be able to see everything. This is the famous, famous Vermeer that's here, which is the girl, the woman in the blue dress. Um, this is, uh, feels like it's a sister painting to the, to the one with the balance that's in Washington, D.C. And here, um, you could see, you know, a million colors of white and blue. This blue that he uses is called corn milk. It's from a flower uh, that they use to make the blue. And they also use lapis lazuli which is very expensive. But what's great about this painting, besides the obvious, huh, you know, which is all the things we already discussed, which is that it catches a moment, like the split of the moment between the, between the ticks of a second hand on a clock here. And you can see the way the light comes through. But what makes this um, uniquely uh, engrossing is not only is her, uh, her contemplative look that she has, and the hundreds of colors of white that are in this thing, you see on her left shoulder over here, right there, you could see, let me, so I'm getting close, let me see if I can just focus closer. You can see here all the different colors of white that he gets into just that shoulder piece right there that really give dimensionality. And you can see a slight fold, right, which comes from underneath her, Gotcha. Which comes from underneath her, uh, underneath her, uh, her, uh, her arm. There is that material that's got folds in it, and you can see it through the, um, through the, uh, you know, the apron that's on the top of her head that covers her shoulder there. That you can see with all the different colors of white. And then you can see reflectively also on the other side, you know, uh, similar uh, technique, but darker in, in the shade. 
this is an expertise that was unsurpassed. It's amazing. Vermeer went through almost 150 years, nobody knew who he was. He was discovered by some French, um, you know, art historian, you know, who started to hunt down his paintings. And so they got 33 of what they figured was like 45 of his paintings. Um, and, uh, but he was unknown, nobody knew him. You could pick this stuff up at garage sales. And in fact, that's exactly where some of his stuff was picked up. But the other thing that is fascinating is you saw on that side over there the, the, uh, the carpet. So this is probably the same carpet on the table here. And the coloring is, um, the coloring is fabulous um, in its detail that you get, you can feel the thickness of the cloth in this. And, um, and with the still, with, 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 again, with the still life that's built in, and of course, this famous map that's in here. And then you also have the hundreds of thousands of colors that come through this window. Why coming through this window? It's, um, it's, it's one of the great masterpieces in the world, uh, it really is. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have it. And if you're a native born New Yorker, you can come here for 25 cents and see this painting. Okay. Now, let's see if we can get back to this one. This one, now he did these allegoricals. So this is the allegory of the Catholic faith. Of course, he did the allegorical of history, which is the one that Adolf Hitler tried to absconder with, which is today in Vienna. And I was thinking about going to Vienna just to see that painting. It's one of the few Vermeers I haven't seen yet that I would like to see. Um, this, uh, this painting doesn't need me to really discuss it too much. There is this effect of uh, realism of the, um, of the uh, curtain, you know, where the, which Vermeer uses on several paintings. This is the only one here that's like that. But, but he does use this effect in several other paintings that you are disturbing this image, so to speak. In this case, this allegory of Catholicism is so, um, you know, it's almost like a statue in its, uh, you know, in its um, hyper theatricalness of it. So it's, it's, you know, she's not going to be disturbed if you bother her because she's busy in a trance. But nevertheless, it's behind this very real um, uh, curtain. And there's a globe. Well, well, just take a look. The Dutch were extremely good at uh, seeing um, this blood on the floor. I don't know what that's supposed to be exactly. That symbolism, to be honest. I got something new to learn right there. But if you look at the, um, the cuff, you know, Van Kuyp did a number of, and Peter Van Kraus, of course, did the Dutch still lives with the uh, silver cups and with glass cups and so on and so forth. Here you have it. The foreshortened arm is excellent, of course, and the color is a blue. But for all this is worth, that one is, uh, I think, painted better. I am favorable towards smaller paintings to begin with, and this is large. And a large painting is designed to be seen from further back to begin with. All right, and then the last Vermeer is this uh, portrait right here. Um, this is what, a sister of the girl, the pearl earring, right? Except. She's just not as beautiful, and I think that's the reason why people don't like this one as much. I don't know if it's because of the way her hair is done, she's just not as charming of a, a looker as in, as in the pearl earring painting. But then again, the pearl earring painting is not supposed to be a real person. Maybe this one is. Maybe this is not a Troni. Um, but here you could see um, the fabulous coloration on her forehead. I hope I can get that. You can see all the subtle uh, work. And one thing about these Vermeers is that you see almost no... Excuse me. Yeah. I need the people to move around because, you know, people are waiting for to see the Arab. You are more polite in the same, okay? I got you. What about the other visitors, okay? Got gotcha. you. Please. Thank you.
And what you see here is this, um, the coloration of the forehead. And um, it's extraordinary. And then the, um, the background and then the earring. There's no brush work. You never see any brush strokes in his work, or rarely. If you look really, really close, you can see them. But he's smooth. The opposite of Rembrandt. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, these are uh, Joe Van Brogo the Younger. Here, the conceptually, the idea is uh, similar, right? Uh, that of these women in contemplative poses. Um, he does a fabulous job in this painting of the pink. The pink is marvelous here. There's literally like thousands of colors of, of, of pink in that, in, that, in that dress. And then there, you can feel the felt also. Very underrated painting. The reason why it's underrated is because the background is um, not as uh, given as much attention as the, uh, as the foreground coloration. And this one here, Here you have, um, it's, you know, the characters here is a stiff, or that's why, to, why uh, Rourke is not considered Vermeer, or Howells for that matter. But um, there's still a master's bit of work here. One of the things that here that he does extremely well in this one, similar to that one, is the texture of the blue uh, and the uh, fur lining that he has here, which is extraordinary, very, very extraordinary. And she's a little bit idealized of what youthful Dutch beauty was like at that period, with that little curl off her high forehead. But um, that's not Vermeer's uh, uh, carpet of tree on that table, you know. And the character's a little bit stiffer in that hand. That hand right there, it's not easy to draw this or to, or to do this in the first place, but it's not right. But the criticize of masterpiece is, is, is kind of silly. This one here is also uh, uh, Gerald de Broch. There you got three women together. This stuff is a little busier. Character's a little stiffer. It's hard to know where the light's coming from this one is altogether. But once again, you see that beautiful satin uh, and that pink satin in that dress. And there in the arm, and the blueness. You can imagine when this was first painted that those colors were brighter and how that, uh, how that deep purple must have radiated out of the background. Um, he definitely has a touch for, um, a touch for, uh, for, for satin and for cloth. And of course that light that's back there, you see that? That is the Alfonsi light, you know, which they must have been uh, familiar with at that point already.
And now we'll go on to Peter de Hoek. Now, if it wasn't for Vermeer, we'd all be talking about Peter van Hoek because uh, Peter de Hoek was just outstanding. And he had this great thing about perspective. Their perspectives were wonderful. And look at the light on her face here. It's just marvelously done, it really is. That glass is just gorgeous. And there's more glass over here that's just gorgeous. And you'd imagine that when this was originally painted, that that painting over there was probably identifiable. Now it's not. Um, at least I don't identify it. Maybe it says something in the literature about it. So you look at this picture, there's so many extraordinary things done in this painting. Um, the, the brickwork on there, um, the, the illusion of the brickwork is extraordinary. The uh, glass, obviously, is fabulous. The white on her face is, is marvelous. Um, the, you have these people that are in here, they're important to the painting, but it's not as important as the composition, as a room, as, as a whole. And he had mastered many, many, many different levels of uh, painting, of many different types of, of, of articles, from the wood up here to the velvet over here, right, before perspective, glass, windowing, light, right. One of the truly great historical painters, Peter, Peter de Hoek, nobody's heard of him. And here is another one by de Hoek. I love this painting, actually, because she's really given him the business, whatever this is. And the white's coming from that upper window, right? Comes down, points over here. Another, another painting. And he's got her by the arm there. Again, with the velvet on the red and that, sh and that shirt. And then there was the workmanship in that, on that uh, sash that's coming underneath the shirt, coming underneath the, uh, the coat. The wood. In the map, you just get the feeling that like, this could have been either, clearly that there must have been some conversation going on between Vermeer and De Hulk, as far as this is concerned. Okay, that's it. Okay, these are um, for some reason they put a bunch of very important Dutch paintings in um, in the dark here. Very dark room. There's artificial light, but that's it. This one is a John Stein. This is the Mets, only John Stein I'm aware of. Maybe there's another one. Um, with the overhead and the party. The thing about John Stein is he gets underrated as just being a, a great artist. Um, his characters are 
obviously in motion and so on in the Chenier painting, but they feel as if that you could, you know, run into them on the street. You know, running out of battery power here also. Okay, this is Adrian Bauer. This is one of my favorite paintings of others painting because it interacts with the user. Franz Halls. Uh, this is actually also John Stein. Here's I was talking about before with the um, with the heating elements underneath her dress, and here she's supposed to be well sick. Is a doctor. This is one of the Mets' real masterpieces, one of the best works that they have. It's supposed to be a theater, theatrical troupe, and this is a great Franz Halls. It's probably the second best Franz Halls, the best one being the Laughing Cavalier which is at the, the Wallace Collection in, in London. And here you can see um, his use of abstract for this uh, elements for what is otherwise a realistic looking um, fabric. I mean, when you get close, you can see it's, it's very abstract in the painting. Also, the, the entire outfit. But then when you stand back, it sure presents itself as real. I mean, that's the magic of Franz Hals. That's why he's one of the three best painters in history. This is amazing. This is Mabel. Are you falling in love?